really exciting to be here. This is my first trip to uh, South Africa, and so I'm very um, really energized. And you know, I've been teasing Nick about you know like running me ragged, um, but um, it really has been a very rich uh, week, and I take home a lot of good learning um, for myself. So my topic is creating a literacy legacy, and basically the the function is why are we doing what we do? And we can be very um, heady about it, but we also have to have it in our heart. So I want to really kind of promote this. No history, no self. No history, no self. So who am I? I am a daughter of Virginia. And to give you the context in the United States, Virginia is right here. So it is toward the south, but not of the deep south. Um, and here is the state of Virginia, and my people are from here. This is uh, the state capital, and this is Farmville, Virginia. So I share that with you to share part of my literacy legacy. This is my great-great-grandfather, Samuel Bowling. He was served as a body slave. He was born into enslavement. He served as a body slave for his master's son. And so um, at that time, it was illegal to educate slaves. So because he had to be with his master's son at all times, he got to go to school. And so he was, in fact, educated by accident. Um, he learned brick making as a trade, and he was hired out by his master to others for his brick making capabilities. And so he was able to accrue some wealth. And then he was, so he was able to buy himself, his wife, <coughs> and his six children out of slavery. He then became a farmer a builder and a brick maker so that most of the downtown of Farmville, Virginia, the old buildings are actually built out of bricks that my great-great-grandfather made. Um, he did, was also allowed to purchase land and on his homestead he built a school, a school for his children and his grandchildren and the neighboring freed ch children of African descent. Uh, he served in the Virginia House of Delegates for two years, and he was also part of a group of people that started um, Hampton Sydney College, um, is now Hampton University. And so education is part of my literacy legacy. And here is my touchstone. Um, in 2000, uh, my family made a pilgrimage to the land that we still own and to the ruins of his home and his school. So this is a brick from my great-great-grandfather's school. So it is literally and figuratively a touchstone for us. My children, my daughter, and my son and I all have a brick from this school. So I see this every day when I wake up. So this reminds me of why I do what I do. It's literally in my blood. So rolling forward 51 years after the passing of my great-great-grandfather, there was student activism in the Farmville, Virginia, because at that time we had separate, we were supposed to have separate but equal education for whites and blacks. The students at Mouton High School were very, being educated very unequally, and so the children decided to strike, led by a 16-year-old, Barbara Johns, and they walked out of the school and they had to do it unbeknownst to their school administrators because they didn't want their school administrators to get into trouble. And so they walked downtown and they marched against the clearly unequal yet separate education that they were receiving. <coughs> and so far, for, at that point there was a lot of activism happening and their suit became part of the Brown versus Board of Education suit that promoted equal education, not separate, but integrated education. 
However, um, the politicians of the Commonwealth of Virginia, uh, in response to the Brown versus Board of Education suit and finding, decided that if they didn't have, pub if didn't have public schools, they wouldn't have to integrate them. So the whole state of Virginia closed all of the public schools for a year. If you don't have public schools, you don't have to integrate them. That was found illegal at the federal level, and so the state opened the schools. However, in Prince Edward County, where Farmville, Virginia is the county seat, they kept the schools closed for another four years. So there were children who did not have access to public education for five years. The white students were going to what you would call fee schools, tuition schools, and the black children were sent away. So this was called the Southern Manifesto. Now if you remember the map of the United States, we're not talking about what you might consider the far south. This is Virginia. You may associate Virginia close to Washington, D.C., you know, very progressive. No, you have to remember that Richmond, Virginia, was in fact the seat of the Confederacy during the Civil War. So we have, and unfortunately, that legacy. So that um, the children, um, four of the black children, had either had to go to relatives outside of the county, or they were actually sent outside of the state, or my great aunts actually helped fund some of the freedom schools so that they didn't, the children could live at home. So they consider themselves, um, they were called by Walter Cronkite, the lost generation or the crippled generation. However, we do not feel that that was our legacy, so that there is now a museum in Farmville, Virginia to the legacy. And as the children said, uh, they call us the lost generation. We are not lost. We are survivors. And so this is a big part of my literacy legacy. My other literacy legacy is my granddaughter, who is now eight years old. She is an avid reader of graphic novels. And my students, and this is our just past graduating class. So what I'd ask you is to think about what is your literacy, looking backward. What is your family's experience with schooling and with literacy? I'll give you a minute to think about that. Does that inform why you do what you do? So here we find ourselves at the Literacy Lagova, here with uh, Fundawande. As Nick mentioned, the goal of Fundawande is that all learners will shall read for meaning in their home language by age 10. And so, that is the goal, also to help prepare our foundation stage teachers to be more effective in teaching children in their first language and English as an additional language. So it fo I really focused on that idea of reading for meaning, because that has lots of meaning. And so I pulled out that reading the message e explicitly, implicitly, that's conveyed by the text, but also considering the meaning that we give to the text, what we bring to the text, so that, and that how we use text to gain meaning, but also to express meaning. So in our own writing and thinking of ourselves as we express ourselves in speaking and writing in our multiple languages. So how do we do this work? How do we support others? I'm gonna present a model of teacher train, tra change process. And this is out of the work of Gusky. So he starts with, you know, it's, it's always an, ar an argument, you know, do we change teachers' hearts and minds or do we change their practice? In Gusky's model, he starts with professional development and then moves into, so that is where we address our problems of practice. What are the sticky wickets? What are the issues? that teachers are dealing with and want to improve on. 
Then we move into the change in the uh, classroom practice. And so that's where the instructional coaching ca uh, comes in. We all know that those one-shot, two-hour professional development does not change our behavior. We may leave with all the good intentions and then, you know, as, as with anything, you know, you make, a, you make a commitment to yourself and as soon as the going gets tough, you go back to the old ways. Right? So that the ongoing coaching helps to make the change in the classroom practice. And then, hopefully, those changes in classroom practice, the intent is that they will change the student learning outcomes. And how do we know that? We think about for ongoing, informal, and formal assessments. And then, hopefully, we've changed the teacher's attitudes and beliefs. So we've changed their practice, and we moved around into changing their hearts and mind. And then we develop effective professional learning communities. <coughs> Opportunities for teachers to share successes and challenges and work collaboratively with each other so that the outcome is good first instruction for the learners, regardless of the, um, the language that is of instruction. So we think about coaching, and there are many paths to the same destination, and that would be positive student outcomes. And as my, some of my friends here, we spent a day talking about directive and responsive coaching and bringing that into thinking about the coaching for to conform, that is to institute a practice or a program, and then coaching into practice. So you take what you've learned and then it becomes part of the way you do things regardless of the instructional program. And then we coach for transformation. How it, are the teachers going to transform the learning for all children, hopefully for all time? I'm just gonna not play around with the, with, the, the, with the little stuff. I'm going for the big stuff. And that helps us create a community of practice so that we can think about our intentions and think about why we teach, who we teach, and then how we teach. And that's all built on relationships. Relationships of trust and collaboration and feedback. So there was a moral imperative from the Ministry of Education to promote foundational skills of reading, writing, and counting and necessities in, for primary school reading and thinking about the 11,000, or I think that's probably a million, foundation phase teachers across the pro provinces. So that's what brings us to our work. That's what makes our work so important and so timely. So in terms of looking forward, I want to think about um, what is your literacy legacy looking forward? What do you want to accomplish in your work? So I'll give you a minute to think about that. And so as we create these communities of practice, we want to think again for ourselves of why we teach or coach, who we teach or coach, and how we teach or coach. And I want to leave you with this thought, if not us, who? If not now, when? Thank you. Hi, Lucia. I wanted to ask in regard to coaching, um, what makes a good coach? What are the characteristics of coaching? Uh, or what are we looking for in a good coach? And then how, um, what are the main contributing factors to good coaching? Um, we, so I feel very new in the coaching model in terms of the EGRC1 project. 
and now the Food Awareness Project, which is using coaching. And I think it's a very new model in South Africa. So I'd like to know what are the type of people that are looking for as coaches, and what are the main things we should be looking for, and how do we transfer those skills? And if you great from the years experience, you can tell us what has worked um, in transferring, uh, in changing practice, um, in teaching practice and attitudes. Okay, thank you. My question will interface the previous presentation to this one. Our literacy, legacy, and the whole question of teaching to read in the whole number. We have a tradition and a heritage or a culture from which we come from, but where we are, we also a hybrid of cultures. Now, I have noticed, and I want to find out what the speakers take on this, that sometimes in the teaching of home language, we use words concept, that are no longer sort of uh, are the mainstream spoken words in our system. And we have, we do have hybrid words that we could use and are used in, 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 in the home language, such that when we go back to use the ways that people themselves are not on the show of because they were not part of the current speak, learners are stuck and they cannot advance. Mm -hmm. But is there any danger in then taking the heritage that we have, which is a kind of a different form of speak and use that in class so that learners make sense of the concept than us going to excavate what and with due respect that may be kind of a fossilized way that even the teacher goes around to ask, what do you call this in space? And I always make my colleagues who know, I will make an example in mathematics. Where is the danger in saying the Tetebu Grande Rand to a grade one run child than insisting the Tete Amashumi Amabi So where is the danger on, on, on using that which we know and can speak to and understand to, which also make it very amenable to the transition into L2 because some of these concepts are resonating. And please, if I offended somebody, apologies. <laughs> Thank you so much, my mother, especially for that family history. It was uh, very moving. I think we all that. So um, I listened to your presentation and enjoyed it a great deal. And when I look at the literature, when I listen to you, I understand coaching to be a form of interaction. Mm -hmm. um, which requires dedicated time and energy between two people. And it's a style of engagement to optimize teacher learning. So if we agree, and I hope we do, mm -hmm. then I want to bring that to a debate that I have with all of my colleagues. Because what we face in South Africa is the urgency of change in the majority of us. And I think that in South Africa, we've taken a view that a coach is an external person who visits a school town. Whereas, whereas I think that's wonderful, where it's possible, and where we have the people, and where we can do things well. But my approach is rather to argue that that style of focused interaction that optimizes teachers' personal growth should be internalized into the practices of the engagements within the school, mm -hmm. whether it's colleague to colleague or head of department, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because I see that in the long term as more sustainable, which doesn't mean these two things are in competition or in contradiction. Mm -hmm. They can assist each other. We need to maximize the use of external people to build internal practices. So the, the question <laughs> is, do you agree with me? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, apparently that's a very typical question of Mary. So. <laughs> well, that was the easiest one, but no, I'll expand. But it's not over to you. Okay, great. All right, I'm going to uh, 
do the first one last um, and and really think about uh, uh, your quest the questions around um, characteristics of coaching, which I think we'll also get to Mary's question. So, so Lucia, I'll start with yours. Um, again, I think that uh, for the coaches need to be experienced teachers. So they need to have walked a mile or two or three or a hundred in teacher's shoes and be able to relate to the teachers with, oh, when I was trying to teach that, it was so hard for me, or this is the way, way I found it easy. So again, reminding the, the coachee that in <laughs> fact you have had that opportunity to teach and struggle and to be uh, very intentional about modeling the coach's growth experience. I used to do this and now I do that. I, I've really shown growth and I'm here to help you think about where you want to grow and provide some ideas about how you can accomplish your goals. So it doesn't become that I'm the expert and I'm jump, you know, going to parachute in you know, put my superpowers on Wonder Woman, Wonder, you know, Superman, whatever, and then kind of like leave. So I think that um, relationship building, trust building um, is very, very important. Not needing to be the smartest person in the room, although you know you are the smartest person in the room. <laughs> um, not needing to be the smartest person in the room, but really look at what the teacher wants. And I really like um, our, my literacy coaches to think about asking the teachers what their problem of practice is. Because you may go into a classroom and say, oh my goodness, the teacher needs to do That's way too much. I mean, if you think about anything you're learning or have learned recently as a novice, you know, we are um, what one of our colleagues at Harvard calls, we have the curse of knowledge that we know how to do something really well and we forget how to teach it to someone who doesn't know how to do it well. When my daughter was two years old, she got a summer cold, we went to my in-laws house, her older cousin was there and I said, Anthony, teach Adrian how to blow her nose. You know, can, if, you, can, if you think about it, no, please don't try it, but if you think about it, how do you blow your nose? You just kind of like blow it. No, there's a whole lot of shaking going on in your head when you do it. And I, I had the curse of knowledge, I couldn't tell it. So when you're having that coaching relationship, you know, what do you want to get better at? And then focus on that one thing. Now in your mind, the coach's mind, you're thinking, oh my God, but when, when are we ever going to get to all these other important things? Sometimes there's one problem of practice that if that gets resolved, a lot of other things fall into place. Or the teacher becomes more con conscious of, OK, in order to solve this problem of practice, I actually need to do this, this, and this, and this before I get here. So then that becomes the internalized, that becomes the internalized growth mindset that the teachers have. So being a good listener, being patient, and looking at teachers with the assets. I really, that's how I walk through life. You know, a little, po very positive. I don't believe that anyone, especially teachers, wake up in the morning, look in the mirror and say, I am going to be the worst teacher today that ever walked the earth. You know, yeah. The coach may feel like that when they see the lesson, like what were they thinking? But that's not their intent. And so assuming good intentions and assuming that they really do want to do right by children and to help them meet that personal goal internalizes the change process. And also the coaches can, and I've seen it um, in my limited school visits with the Funduwande coaches, is they bring the teachers together. So then the teachers develop that community of practice that Oh, I can share with someone in my own school of something that's going well and why, something that I want to do better and why. And so then that's when the change becomes institutionalized. And that's when we move to coaching for, for transformation, that we've transformed the relationships that teachers have among each other so it doesn't, um, isn't totally dependent on the coach being there. Okay, so we've done characteristic of coaching. Um, 
we want to think about home languages. And so um, coaching interactions, we're, we're done, we're good, good. Okay, so that was a two for, two for one. So in terms of language, um, language is li lives. It changes. You know, 10 years ago, we didn't have Google and it wasn't, and it wasn't a verb, you know, or a noun, the Google, I Googled it, please Google it. So I think that acknowledging the change of language, and, and I'm very old school, you know, I'll say something like, um, oh, all that in a bag of chips, and my daughter goes, Mom, we don't say that anymore. So again, creating relationships within classrooms where when children don't understand what we're saying, kind of explain our intent. It goes back to what Catherine was saying about using meaning and having metalinguistic knowledge that language thing. So if I was going to do da 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 da, what would you call it? And then you use the children's language and say, okay, you call it this, I call it that. And you may go from region to region or some places within your region. Um, America you know, is, is, uh, is, has English, but it has lots of different styles of English. And so what we call things in one region, we don't call things in the other. I remember my husband, um, when we first got married, he asked me for a common pin. And I said, a straight pin or a safety pin? I want a common pin. A straight pin or a safety pin? This could be a deal breaker here, you know? Um, and in fact, he meant a straight pin. And, but he didn't know what a straight pin was. He knew what a common pin was. And so we lived happily ever after, kind of sort of. Um, at least for 10 years, we lived happily ever after. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's just, just really acknowledging that language changes and, and, and language is vibrant. And that's what makes it so exciting. I think that's why Catherine and I like studying it, is because it's never the same way twice. Um, so I think that we want to acknowledge the home language and that the, the, we would call it in the United States a dialectal change. Um, you know, is it, is it a rotary or a roundabout? You know, it depends on, yeah, in, in the United States it's a rotary. Or a traffic circle. So it's a rotary, a traffic circle, or a roundabout. You know, or whatever you call it here, please don't hit me while I'm in it. <laughs> So I think that, you know, then that's a way to get uh, language transfer. In terms of the politics, I mean, I think, you know, that we need to be impassioned. We need to have our own intellectual arguments, but we need, there needs to be some passion in our arguments when we're you know, addressing the political issues. But I also think that we can tap the emotional intelligence, I use that word loosely, of our politicians, at least in the United States. Um, I won't say anything about the politicians in South Africa because I don't know any. Um, but I think that we need to deal with um, that kind of Gusky's model of this is the practice and this is the hearts and minds. Um, Pamela, uh, you know, I think the question of cheap teacher change is the million dollar question. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what your views are of the effectiveness <coughs> of scripted lessons or scripting teachers in effecting teacher change. Thanks, Hillary. Um, it's it. I think it scripting is helpful for our novice teachers, and how we start them off with a scripted lesson, and then give them the agency through coaching to think about. All right, so I'm really like sticking with this script and I'm talking at children, not with children. And so getting through the first year or two with a scripted program and then you kind of find your sea legs and you should at that point be given permission and encouraged to really think about in the moment changes that you're making in the script to address the learners in front of you. Oftentimes, you know, teachers can be so tied to the script that they forget to look up and see the 40 or 50 children in front of them and think, okay, they're climbing the walls, they're under the desks, this isn't going so well right now. 
But um, uh, my students actually have to um, interrogate some different reading programs, and they're very funny because I ask them about, you know, for which types of teachers should different programs be applied, and they all go to highly scripted programs for novice teachers, very agency-oriented, teacher-developed curriculum for the, for, the, for the experienced teachers. But, you know, you have to last as a novice teacher to get to the point where you're an experienced teacher. And sometimes it just can be totally overwhelming. In the United States, we have a lot of churn. Uh, many of our new teachers don't last five years. And so there's this constant. Thank you.